All right. Um, hey, everybody. I know it's the last session of the day. I'll try to keep you awake. I know you're probably anxious to get to dinner and to the party tonight. So uh, we'll go through a lot of information. I'm a kind of a practical guy. So there will be a lot of practical kind of lessons learned um, from the analytics implementation. And then we'll have a couple of interesting, cool cases. Toward the end, you'll see how we can use this framework. So just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm director of digital analytics at Cox Communications. Been with Cox for 13 years, uh, managed a variety of things, managed the commerce content uh, on the product marketing side, side sales. Um, so it's been quite a journey. Uh, Cox Communications is a telecommunications provider, so it provides internet, TV, and phone services, and now home security to residential and business um, users. Uh, during this 13 years at Cox, it's been a fun journey. Uh, been awarded Cox Innovator of the Year Award several times. Uh, we are using Adobe products, so I will reference Adobe, this and that. But this information is kind of universal. It's not really tied to Adobe. So if you are not on Adobe, if let's say you use Google Analytics, it's going to be just as applicable to you as it is for Adobe. And I live with, in Virginia with my family, two kids. We have a Golden Retriever Sunny and a Hamster Teddy. So a pretty stereotypical kind of situation and family. And talking about stereotypes, um, one thing that um, I think this is how the world sees my job, right? When you, when you say somebody, you're in digital analytics, right? So immediately it's something boring, uneventful, kind of crunching numbers, generating reports, sending emails with Excel spreadsheets, kind of uneventful and boring. So in reality, how I view my job is, is almost exactly the opposite of that. So I think we're actually in the middle of the modern day gold rush. So the difference between gold rush back when there was actual gold and this gold rush is that this is um, a digital gold rush. So the job is to find out the nuggets of gold in this pool of digital data. And it's pretty exciting because you basically start the day not knowing what you will find today. So one of the tests that I use personally uh, is a get out of bed test. So if I get up in the morning and I'm looking forward to the day at work, that means that I'm actually at the right work. I do the right things. And if I reach the point where that's no longer the case, then I should find something else that I will be excited about because life is too short. So it's really exciting, rewarding, and innovative. And uh, you would say, well, how is it possibly can be innovative and all that stuff? And I'll show you in this deck what you can do with the data these days, which I think completely blows um, just about anything else I can think of that I would be doing at Cox in terms of innovation. So success factors of this gold rush. Um, so I think there are two critical pieces there. First one is to implement a robust, uh, robust analytics solution. And we implemented it through Telium, and this is where this whole idea of this deck came around because there was a lot of lesson learned and kind of things that you want to do and don't want to do, and that's what I wanted to share with you. So the first part of the deck is going to be all around that. And then the second part, I'll show you some specific use cases where we use the data to drive some innovative things uh, that were not, would not be possible without that data. So analytics implementation. Background. Uh, so I took over Telium at Cox in January 2015. And the first um, thing I wanted to mention, I, have, I had no prior knowledge of Telium. So I'm literally a year and a half into Telium journey. I'm not a programmer. I, was, uh, I attended Telium University last year, and I, took, uh, I learned about it for the first time, basically. I'm not a programmer at all by the background. I know enough to be dangerous. I know my limitations. So I'm not pretending to be a programmer. In fact, I'm a part of the Cox sales team. Um, so I took analytics. Uh, I took over the analytics uh, at Cox, and uh, we did the audit. Right? We've tried to figure out what's going on in analytics and how it worked. Right? So right away, it was pretty clear that we had a, a, quite a disaster in our hands. Right? We had a hard-coded, outdated implementation that was implemented many years back. It was like six years old at that time. Right? Um, everything was hard-coded, so there was no tag management system at all. The, whole, the code was hard-coded in the pages, right? And that meant that we were living in a two to three months turnaround time IT release cycles. So whatever you want to do, you have to wait for two to three months before IT can actually do it for you. And once they're done, 
you don't know how that's going to be done, right? So sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's incorrect. If it is incorrect, guess what? It's another two, three month cycle, right? To correct now something that they messed up and something new to implement, right? The code was, I, I call it unstable analytics code because things constantly broke. In fact, uh, spend most of my time fixing things instead of actually digging into data and extracting any insights and useful information out of it, right? Uh, Outdated solution design, we looked at all the variables that we used, 75% of them were either irrelevant or broken. So we just basically implement, we had this implementation that we were populating random data into random variables and nobody used them because they were really not relevant to the business anymore. So uh, the first idea was, hey, let's try to repair it. And then really quickly it became like, well, there's nothing to repair here. We need to blow the whole thing up and rebuild it from scratch, right? So we need to do a complete redo. So we started with the business requirements. I think uh, that was one of the most important steps in the entire process. Instead of digging into technology part and EVARs and all the variables and events and all that stuff, start with what it is that you actually want to solve. So start with the business questions and spend as much time as possible doing through it. I mean, just to give you an idea, so we talked to Adobe folks, typical solution design implementation is around 40 different business requirements. We had 270 in our implementation. So um, I met for a week with 13 different teams. We actually had a Cox uh, team on our side that we basically went and interviewed various teams. Uh, and we really made it clear that, hey, let's think it through ahead of time. Because if, if something new comes up later on, it's going to be a really ex expensive change order. Think about building a house. So if you have a blueprint, right, that you start building a house with a blueprint. Imagine that later on you decide to add another door somewhere and how much it would cost you to now change the whole thing and, and figure out how to put that door in. So it's the same thing here. So um, important step. Then we implemented the solution design. So the solution design basically translates the business requirements into the variables. And I put here, it's Adobe world, you know, we are printing in EVARs, events, props, uh, but whatever, if it's Google Analytics, it's variables, right? So it basically translates solution Solution design translates your business requirements into the variables. Um, outlined what each variable does, created a document that really detailed the whole thing and the whole structure, and then uh, we tied it to the business requirements. So pretty straightforward. Then the UDO comes in. So UDO is a universal data object, right? So this is where you store all the data. And the UDO is built now based on the solution design. So now you have business requirements translated into solution design. And then based on the solution design, you have the UDO. And in the UDO, you have um, variables, right? And a couple of things I included here in the tips. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but just watch out for this because this is the areas I can guarantee you. If you go through this, you will face that. And this will be the issues, like the variables versus arrays. Like if you need to match anything in the UDO and you have multiple variables that describe something, like one piece of information, like an offer, and you have offer ID in one variable, offer name in the other, you need to use arrays and you need to make sure that they match. Uh, UIT team will miss it. They will not understand the whole concept. You need to kind of explain it to them. Um, another thing that came out is that uh, you really do not want to, we use, I mean, you would think, how on earth would you implement 270 requirements in a really limited set of variables and analytics, right? Because Adobe gives you, what, 100 EVARs, you know, more events, but limited number of S props, right? So you concatenate a lot, meaning you combine pieces of data together using some kind of a delimiter, right? And then you put this in analytic and then you classify things, right? You, class, you, you kind of translate that concatenated value into now some kind of separate string of values, right? So here you, you definitely do not want to concatenate in the UDO. You want to UDO have uh, single values, and then you combine them in Tulium, it's really easy to do. Instead of asking UIT to provide the concatenated values straight in the UDO, right? Uh, and then you really want to stick with some patterns and examples for each UDO variable. In other words, you don't want to be random. You need to decide early on uh, casing, you know, how do you want to combine the different pieces of data? And then you have to stick with it because otherwise, we even ran into some issues where we inherited some variables that had to be carried through, and then it resulted in, in extra work that really shouldn't be there if you do it right from the very beginning. So 
Step number four, the easiest thing ever. You tell your IT how to implement Telium in the UDO. So Telium has a technical guide, like a three, four page document, just tells, hey, take this code, put it on this page. Piece of cake, right? And then the UDO is early, uh, put the UDO as early on the page as possible. Really straightforward. Now this is um, where I wanted to introduce you to the law of UDO misinterpretation. Basically says that if, if something can be misinterpreted by your technology team that will actually implement the UDO, it will be misinterpreted. It's a guaranteed thing, right? And if you think that it cannot be misinterpreted, then you'll be, really, you'll be surprised because it will be misinterpreted at some point. Uh, universal, I have seen it working every single time. So that means, so that whole part of the technology team implementing the UDO is definitely by far is the toughest part of this entire implementation. We spent about six months implementing our entire solution design. 80% of that time was spent on testing UDO, going through 100 plus rounds of revisions with the technology team, don't letting them get away with anything. We basically just said, no, it has to work this way. We are not gonna cut any corners. This is the variable, this is the pattern, this is the value we expect. Make sure that it is in that value, in that format, in that spot on this page. So we went back and forth. Uh, Hands-off approach does not work. So, uh, I mean, the first kind of idealistic world was like, hey, well, we'll create this really cool documentation, send it to technology team, they will interpret it for us and they'll understand everything correctly and they will implement it perfectly for us. Does not work. So the, everything will be misinterpreted, guaranteed. You need to go and I, we, we had, I got to know the programmers who actually implemented it. We had the daily calls with those programmers. We made sure that they understood what they're doing because the programmers do not understand analytics. They do not understand EVAR, EVARs, events, SPROPs, any of that stuff. They just, they just need to implement it to mark it off the list of to-dos. That's all they care about. They just timelines and the time spent on developing it, right? So it's your job to make sure that they do it correctly. And then um, this one is another point that incremental versus the state values of variables turned out to be exceptionally tricky. And what I mean by that is uh, think about shopping cart events, for example, right? So you pro the user adds product A to the shopping cart, right? So the UDO variable now includes the product A and some event that says they added to the shopping cart, right? Then the user adds product B to the shopping cart. Well, if you have the cart addition event, you do not want to say that the cart now contains product A and B and the event is shop cart add, right? Because now you're double counting that product A because from Adobe Analytics point of view, it will look like product A was added twice because it's associated with two add to shopping cart events, right? So in this case, it's incremental. So you would say, well, whatever they added to the cart needs to be shown in the UDO. Versus, let's say, the checkout page. Checkout page is a snapshot, right? So it includes everything that is in the cart at that point. So that's where we show all products in the cart. So it, it can get really tricky, so just pay attention to this. If you go through this implementation, uh, just make sure you understand the whole incremental versus state values and how they differ, uh, especially in the you know in your analytic solution. So the Telium implementation. So I happen to work with one of the best I think engineers at Telium, uh, Justin Fitzgerald. Uh, he was amazing. The guy knew his stuff like like I have never seen anybody else know his stuff like that. Uh, in fact, I learned most of the things that I know about Telium from Justin because it was constant, you know, back and forth. Uh, we ended up writing 100 plus custom extensions to handle all these business requirements. We ended up with a lot of unused variables in Adobe. So we implemented 270 requirements and end up, we have like 30 or 40 EVARs that are still available. We have SPROPs is still available. So with the right implementation, you can really squeeze a lot of data into your single reporting suite in Adobe. So we, have, we run multiple tags in multiple environments. We implemented the Telium library. If you're not familiar with how the libraries work in Telium, I'll find out. It's a really cool thing. It allows you to basically create a version control and do like a parallel track development. So we have all of our analytics stuff implemented in the standalone library and then we merge that library to the main profile when we're ready to push it live. So that has, allows us a lot more ex, extra flexibility. And it is complicated. I mean, there's no way around it. I mean, looking back, I would say from one to 10, it's, it's basically around nine. Like how complicated it is to implement this, writing all these extensions, JavaScript, a lot of JavaScript. So you need to kind of be comfortable in a lot of things. And then the uh, 
test and launch, this uh, final step, obviously, we implemented dev reporting suite, production reporting suite, so we were able to test things extensively before actually um, going live. Um, so final thoughts on the implementation. Uh, I would say, you know, yeah, you can do a lot of things. Telium has an amazing interface, right? So the tool is like the world friendliest tool ever. Uh, you can do a lot of things with drag and drop and all that, but at some point you will hit the point where you need to do some more customization that the drag and drop and all the visual uh, widgets allow you, right? So this is where you get into JavaScript extensions, for example, right? So I'm, I don't think you need to be like a, an amazing programmer, but you need to know that some tools, like for example, I use a Chrome, Google Chrome, so there's the dev tools, right? So I would say at the minimum, you need to be comfortable with the console, network, and sources tab of that tool. And I, I put here, there's like a free course that Google offers. There's a ton of resources out there that will teach you how to use those tools. It's not really that complicated. Uh, learning basic JavaScript, uh, if you want to do your own extensions or eventually understand how existing extensions work or troubleshoot anything, you would need to know some basic JavaScript. Um, Use your Telium support hours. I mean, you have support hours, I think, in the, in the contract. We use everything we could use. Uh, so in a lot of things, um, actually, I asked Telium engineers, and they will do it for you. They will record the session. So I would ask, hey, Justin uh, or Karen, hey, can you guys record the session for me? Uh, so when you walk me through, so then send me the video, and I have like a library of different videos that I can go back and reference how to do things. And I name them, so it's, it's a really cool resource to have later on. So that was the implementation. So we got all this data. It's really cool. It's really exciting. So now what can we possibly do with it, right? So I want to show you a few projects. So the first one is we call it the grid, right? Uh, quick background information. It's kind of hard to see here because it's so small. Uh, we have the e-commerce funnel. Um, and uh, in the e-commerce funnel, we have um, the offers, right? So we sell internet, TV, and phone. And if people don't see the pre-configured offer that they like, they can go and customize their own offer. So we call it BYOB, has nothing to do with beer. Okay, it's build your own bundle. But uh, it's customize your offer. So those are the squares that you can see each square kind of corresponds to different layer levels of TV service, internet, and phone service, right? So it's all good, except, uh, hmm, except that all my bullet points are missing here. But uh, uh, so basically, the problems here were that um, we had a few issues, right? The customers couldn't see the pricing on any of the squares. Like you had to click on the square to see how much it would cost. I mean, who's shopping blindly? Like unless you're, you know, some billionaire or whatever, uh, you really want to see the price right before you add the service. Uh, there was no way to compare anything. Like how do you know how this combination compares some other versus some other combination? Finally, we had some special offers in place that imagine that certain combination of the squares would result in much better price than other combination of squares. And how would you ever know, unless you happen to hit those combinations, uh, you would never even know about that, right? So definitely a problem. So that was back in September of uh, 2015. I've looked at it and I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to do it. So I just fire up the Photoshop and create a little sketch saying, hey, how about this little concept? You know, what if we showed the grid that would have a TV and internet pricing and the combinations and it would show the prices and it would show some descriptions of, of what's, what's in it. So as you click on it, you can interact, you can see what's included. It's kind of like kayak, you know, the kayak site for flights comparison. So it's really not that new of a concept, but for us it was relatively new. And then people can select whatever offer, click on customize and go on. Uh, we also had this thing uh, called uh, channel lineup. So we found out that our customers really pay attention to the channels when they shop online, right? So they want to buy not just the advanced TV package, but they want to find out which package includes the channels that they actually like, and they want to get that package, right? So we could use this concept of a channel uh, lookup tool here at the bottom where people can actually enter, type in the channel, and as they type it in, it kind of disables the packages that don't include that channel. Okay, so um, we also, the idea was also to create a responsive mobile version, obviously, and we wanted, we did not want to have any degrading functionality versus desktop, so people could do on the mobile version the same exact thing that they did on the desktop. So back in September, again, the for, Photoshop, a little sketch, like, hmm, how about this, how about that? What if we played around with some ideas? 
basically had a wireframe set up, then I shipped it to um, designers. Designer basically took it quickly and designed a semi-polished version uh, with the idea that we would launch it, test it via target, and then see how it works. And if it works, great, then we'll launch it everywhere. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just scratch it off and move on, right? Um, so Telium, Telium role, role in this test, right? So this is all great, but we needed to track things in the app. Even on the test phase, when we launched it in target, right, we still wanted to find out things, for example, offer click path, right, some behavioral analysis. Like what are the offers that people click and in which sequence? So that kind of gets you some behavioral analytics. So you can get into people's minds of like how they think through the shopping process, which offers they click in which sequence, right? Um, what TV channels they edit and what TV channels they removed and how those TV channels affected the offers that they selected. So we needed to, comp like even the, for the test, we needed to combine all this analytics together, right? So with Telium, a piece of cake. I mean, it's like this uh, UTAG link functionality. So we implemented a bunch of UTAG links around key events in the grid and it, it fired off. It just passed on the variables to analytics and we captured it in the, in a few EVARs and one SPROP for pathing analysis and boom, it was all done. So it's literally this part didn't take any time at all. And it really allowed us to dig deeper into different patterns. The, cur the turnaround time was literally, I mean, I think uh, maybe like a day to, to implement the Telium to analytic bridge of data so we could capture all this data, right? So based on this, like you can see here, like we determined like here's the offers and and here is how people navigate the offers. Like here is the most popular offers and they go in this direction, that direction. Build some flow charts uh, around which offers they click on, where they go to, which offers they click next. Um, did all kinds of analysis around TV channels. Uh, and uh, basically the results were amazing. So we launched this, 23% increase in conversion. We had the increase in multiple product lines. We track one, two, three P, which is different, one, or two or three products, so telephone, internet, TV. So basically it's a multi-million dollar impact on revenue. So we launched the test in December, we ran it for a couple of weeks, we got to 95% confidence in the data through Target, and then we launched it countrywide in January of 2016. So from idea in September to countrywide in January. Uh, think about it in terms of, that that's the time that would normally take our IT to implement anything. That's like a typical three month cycle, right? That's without Telium. With Telium, it's from the idea to successful data around the test. So pretty interesting. So here is another case I um, wanted to share with you. So the page load time. So this one is actually outside of a typical way of people thinking about analytics, right? So analytics usually like page views, some events, some conversions, this and that. So page load time. So here's the context, right? So we implemented a new CMS Adobe Experience Manager on the site in September of 2015, and right away noticed the sluggish site performance. So the pages, it felt like they loaded slowly, right? At that time, we really didn't have any tools um, that measured the site's performance or the page load performance, right? There was nothing available that we had, so because it was never a problem. The site historically loaded pretty quickly, right? So now we, we go to IT and say, hey guys, site is loading fast, uh, slow. And they say, well, looks fast enough to us. Really not that big of a problem. We're like, okay, so that means that we need to quantify the, the data, right? We need to quantify the issue. If we don't quantify it, the problem doesn't exist, right? So how do you quantify this thing? And it's much deeper than it looks on the surface, right? It's not just how many seconds it takes for a page to load, but how does it affect different segments? How, the, how about mobile versus desktop? How, this, how about the sales? What's the, what's the page load time effect on the sales? Try to tie those two together, right? So how do you do all this? Like, okay, so that was September. So we went to Telium. Uh, in Telium, so Telium allows you to basically implement a solution it's not out of the box, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. So the browser hell, uh, has a built-in performance timing object. So that object, I have an example here, right? It captures all the key events like DOM content ready, fetch start, like all the, everything that is important that happened in the browser is in this performance timing object, right? So the, the long number is the Unix 
uh, timestamp, which is number of milliseconds that passed from January 1st of 1970. So in other words, if you take any of these two events, right, and you have access to them in Telium, so in JavaScript, you can actually take any events you want and you can subtract one from the other and it will give you the number of milliseconds it took for that event to happen, right, on the page. So that's exactly what we did. So we, did, we calculated, wrote the JavaScript extension in Telium that captured the difference between several key timestamps. And then we scoped it to analytics tag and then we passed it on to analytics tag to, to capture the data for the load time. Uh, I captured it in, a, in just a simple S prop. And so it's on every page load, we calculate it. We have that value. And then we test it in lunch. So the whole thing took two days. That's two days to find out how to solve this problem, uh, write the code, implement it, launch it, and start getting the data, right? So then we like, okay, that's cool. So we have all this data. How about the segments, right? So let's take it one step further. So we, now we have the data in an SPROP. So we put it in an uh, Adobe Report Builder. We use Adobe Report Builder to, to build a whole bunch of dashboards that are automatic. I love Report Builder, just tools that eliminates the need to email something manually every day. So in a, in a report builder, we put it in. I created, um, for the SPROP, you can e easily classify it into brackets, right? So you don't want to deal with 50,000 values of different, in millisecond load time for each page, right? Because that's unmanageable. But if you bracket things, so think about bracketing like zero to two seconds, two to four seconds, four to six seconds, more than six seconds, right? So if you have that kind of bracketing and you classify your data, then you can easily uh, create useful reports. Like we have charts by each bracket to show you daily how each page performs, for example. But here we build some dashboards, so it's a recurring daily report. Uh, and then we, once it's in analytics, right, you can segment it by whatever you want. So we segment it like customers, non-customers, mobile, broadband, build some charts, build, build some day over day, week over week, month over month comparison with the trend data, with the high points, you know, on the little, um, uh, the red line right there is a high point, the green line is a low point for the 28 day period, period minimum, maximum. Then we're like, okay, this is, this is great, but how do you create something on the page level, right? So they, okay, so we created this little format right here, the middle chart, right? So this is for each page, uh, it shows you the percentage of time that certain bracket was met. So for each page, you can see here, like the gray bar is the range for the week for that page, okay? Then the blue dot is where you ended up on that previous day. And then we had the uh, average for the page is that little gray, little speck type of um, mark right there. Sometimes it's in the middle, sometimes it's not in the middle, right? So the, the purpose of the middle the little gray spec is to show you if the data is skewed one way or the other, because the range will show you the entire range, right? But if the page was loading only one time on the low side, but nine times on the high side, then the range will not tell you what really happened, but range with that little mark now being almost all the way to this side, right? Because on average, it was all the way on this side. We'll tell you that entire story that pages, so the page, like the, the bigger the gray bar, the more unstable the page is because it varies now, the, the page load time, right? The more the spec is toward uh, any end, so the more it is away from the middle, the more um, the page basically either you, you hope it's gonna to be toward the good side of the, of the range, right? Not the bad side of the range. And then the blue dot tells you where the page landed today so you can see how it performed uh, versus the ra date range. And this is, by the way, this is all down in Excel. So this is like a insane, like seven different series combined in error charts and all that stuff. But you guys know that. Um, so, so this is all, this is, I mean, this report right here, I mean, uh, you would need to pay a lot of money to some dedicated tools that will create something similar to this. And now you can just use Telium and you can use analytics and pull this data and no external tool will tie it to segments. And this is what the value is, right? Because no other tools will have the same exact segments as what your data uh, is captured in analytics. So um, summary key takeaways, um, get creative. So the limits are really, I put here, they, they exist only in your head. Really? So you can do so much with Telium and analytics and a clean data set. 
it's, it's just mind blowing, right? Um, build, I mean, you can build a killer new analytic system with Telium. It's, it, it can be, it's flexible, accurate, and robust. And it's a living system, so we keep changing things, we keep adding things. The solution design document is a living document. We go, I, I would say it's probably changes once a week. We keep adding things to it, updating it with the, with the new data points. Um, you can definitely be innovative and experiment a lot in your data position. And you have access to the data that a lot of people in your organization don't, so you are already at the advantage. So it's almost like there's no excuse for you not to do it, right? And then I would just encourage you to use Telium to test new concepts and ideas. I mean, really, uh, there is so much stuff like those two use cases out there, it's, it's not even funny what you can do. It's really the limit is the time. So you just need to pick your battles and figure out what's worth uh, doing. Other than that, you, you have all the tools at your disposal. So that's, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, now maybe we'll take some questions. Thank you.